Hey there YouTube, welcome back to the Mr. Sin channel. Today we're gonna to be talking about demand. This video is gonna go over the law of demand, marginal utility, diminishing marginal utility, shifters to demand, and a bunch of other content. So sit back, relax, as we figure out what's going on with demand. So in this video, we're going to be talking about demand. Now eventually we'll get into supply, but we'll save that for another time. Right now, you have a demand to learn about microeconomics, supply and demand, and better understand the world around us, which is fantastic. Now with that demand though, in order for us to factor you into the demand, there has to be a couple different things. One, you have to have the desire, where right now you're showing that, you're still watching this video. You also have to have the willingness to. So not just, oh, I want to learn, but I'm actually going to try and I'm gonna put effort towards that. And you have to have the ability. All three things right now you have, so you're actually part of the demand. Every company, whenever we're talking about microeconomics or with anything with the economy, when companies are looking at their demand for their products, they are only looking at people who meet this criteria. If you were to say no to any of these, or let's say you don't have maybe enough money to buy their product, well, you're not gonna be factored into the demand because they're looking for consumers that possibly are going to be and are going to be customers. They're wanting to know who are their actual customers at all the different price points. Now we're gonna get into how price points affect demand and also a bunch of different things of how demand changes coming up. But it's important to remember, in order to be factored into a demand, you have to have the desire, the willingness, and the ability to be able to purchase those products. So let's figure out about the law of demand and then look at how demand can change. On the screen right now, you can see my demand schedule. Now, the demand schedule is just showing us the relationship between quantity demanded and also the price and the relationship between the two. We can see at each different price, we have a different quantity demanded. Now, if we were looking at a demand curve, we would just be looking at this same information, but in a chart format instead of a table. And this is all looking at like one snapshot in time. So that's a really important to remember. These are all of the different outcomes that could happen if we changed our price for this exact moment. A lot of things will change demand and we'll get into that a little bit later on. But one really important concept that we can already see is the law of demand. Look at this table right now, our demand schedule. As our price goes up, our demand starts to go down. And as our demand starts to go up, our price goes down. There's an inverse relationship happening here. Now, the easy way to remember this is just think of yourselves. Think of real life. When you go to the store, are you more likely to buy more when there's a sale or are you more likely to buy something when the price goes up? Hopefully you said that when the price goes down, you're gonna be buying more, that would make sense. It wouldn't really make sense to go into a store and wait for prices to go up to then purchase more of that item. So what happens is as products get cheaper, they become a better value. And so consumers start to purchase more of them. And that's just the law of demand. Prices go up, you're gonna see your quantity demanded go down. As prices go down, our quantity demanded will go up. So it's really important to understand that law. And it's gonna come back up all throughout our unit and throughout this class. Now it's not just the price that is motivating people to buy less of an item. There's other factors at play. One concept that's really important to understand is marginal utility. Marginal utility is just this extra satisfaction you get from consuming or using one more item. So if you were eating food, for example, every bite you eat into that sandwich or whatever it may be, that extra, so each bite, that satisfaction you get from it, that would be your marginal utility. Now, one really important economic concept happens all the time, and that's diminishing marginal utility. Every time I bite into that sandwich, it's no longer as new. I understand what it's gonna taste like. And maybe the more and more I continue to eat, eventually what starts to happen is I get kind of sick of it. It's no longer that good to me. Over time, my marginal utility goes down. Diminishing marginal utility just states that. As we continue to consume more of things, we get less satisfaction from each additional use from it. So over time, we'll then start to slowly consume less and less until eventually we won't be maybe even consuming it or using it or purchasing it at all. It's not just sandwiches and food that this impacts. Companies use this all the time. Disney World is a perfect example of this. If you buy more tickets to go into Disney World or Disneyland, what happens is the price of each ticket goes down. It's a lot cheaper to buy 10 days worth of Disney World than just one. 
Now, you'll be spending more in total, that is true, but the ticket price drops dramatically. And that's because Disney knows every time you visit the Magic Kingdom, so while the first time may be magical and amazing, as you continue to go back, what's going to happen is you are getting less enjoyment. And so what they do is they lower the prices of their tickets so you don't feel as bad. And it counters this diminishing marginal utility effect. Because now you're no longer going there and saying, oh, I shouldn't have paid over $100 for the Magic Kingdom. I've already seen this. It isn't that cool. Now all of a sudden you're like, hey, I actually got a pretty good deal here. The park is still pretty fun and I'm enjoying myself. So this is a really important concept to understand. It's part of the reason why our demand curve is sloped downwards. Now, let's get into a couple other examples of what would even shift a demand curve. Demand changes for a bunch of different reasons. Now, one of the really important things to understand with a change in demand is the difference between change in demand and a change in quantity demanded. Now they sound really similar and I get how for some of you, you're probably like, that's the same thing, Mr. Sin, you're crazy. But there's actually a difference and it's important for you to understand what the difference is. When we're talking about a change in quantity demanded, we're staying on the original demand curve. So on the screen right now, you can see this demand curve. At $5, our demand is going to be 20. And at $4, our demand is going to be 30. This would show a change in quantity demanded. Our prices fluctuate a little bit, we're staying within the same curve, and we're seeing our demand go up. Now, on the other hand, what I'm about to go into is a bunch of different ways that we can see a change in demand. This is going to shift now our demand curve. So at $5, instead of it being 20, now we could see if we have a change in our demand, it is gonna shift up or down. For this example, it is gonna increase, and it's gonna go up to 40. So now at $5, people are demanding 40. So there has been a change in demand, not the quantity demanded. That is referencing the original demand curve as it's moving. Remember, these are snapshots in time. So now something has impacted this market. And there's six different things that can cause a change in demand. And I'm gonna go through them right now so that way you understand all of them. One of the first things that can change demand is income. If people have more or less money, that changes their purchasing habits. Now, it's not as simple as when people have less money, they're going to purchase less. Because it depends on what good we're talking about, what service, what are we actually purchasing here? Where is our demand? Now with that comes our next two things, our substitute goods and complements. It's really important to understand the relationship between income and a complement good and a substitute good. For substitute goods, these are goods that if, let's say, I would not purchase brand name ketchup, I'm gonna purchase the off-brand. If I'm not buying steak, it's ramen. These are goods that are kind of inferior goods. They're not as quality, and I would buy them instead of another good. Normally, what's gonna happen here is when the substitute good is cheap enough, and the difference between the a normal good, the brand name, maybe the more quality, and also our substitute good is significant, then the consumer is gonna start purchasing more of the substitute good. So when people have less money, they're more likely actually to purchase substitute goods. So for a substitute good, the demand might go up when consumer income goes down. While the brand name good, a normal good, maybe even a luxury good, all of a sudden starts to see a decrease. For complement goods, these are things that we buy together. Think of like a tennis ball and a tennis racket. If all of a sudden the tennis racket went up to $5,000 for one racket, odds are people play less tennis. And what's gonna happen then is the demand for tennis balls will decrease, even though nothing happened with the price of tennis balls. But they're complement goods. If I buy one, I'm probably gonna buy the other. So they affect each other. If the price of one goes up, well, demand for the other will go down. Or if all of a sudden our tennis rackets become just a dollar and now more people start playing tennis, the demand for our tennis balls will also increase. The next thing is our consumer tastes. Over time, things come into fashion and trends happen and people start to develop new tastes for food and all these different products and they change throughout time. So maybe something falls out of style and people no longer want to purchase it anymore. Or they decide that they got sick because they got food poisoning and all of a sudden now they're not going to be consuming this type of food. So consumer taste could shift also our demand. With this, we also have expectations. One perfect example of this is for phones. Apple, Samsung, 
all the different big phone couples, Google, now they all release their phones pretty close to when they announce it. And that's not by an accident. They don't announce the next iPhone at the start of the year. Because what would happen is it changes consumers' expectations. If I know that this new phone is going to have all these new features, I'm not going to buy the current model. So they actually wait. They hold their conference right before they're going to actually release their phone to the public. Because what would happen if they released the, all of the information about the phones at the start of the year, people now have changed their expectations of what a quality phone is. And they'll switch their purchasing habits because of that. So change of expectations can have a huge impact. Same thing if I think that, let's say, oil is going to go down in the future, I might hold off on purchasing gas. If you think something's going to happen, you'll change your behaviors because of it. Then the last one is going to be our number of consumers. The number of people buying something definitely impacts the demand. I mean, demand is looking at people purchasing stuff. This also can impact the price as well if supplies start to run out. Black Friday is a perfect example of that. Sales are created and certain deals are to attract people into the store. Those sales, though, not all the time are created to cover everyone. They're trying to just get you into the store to be able to get you to purchase different things. So these six things are the main things that impact demand. And remember, this is a change in demand, not just a quantity change in demand, which is focusing just on one point in time. These are actually shifting our demand curve. Now we're almost done with this video, but don't tune out yet because we still have one really important thing to go over, and that's some different types of demand. Now what's happening here is we have elasticity at play, and it's going to be important to understand this because later on in the unit, you're going to have to understand how to do the math part of this to definitively prove if something is an elastic demand, inelastic, or a unit elastic. Now don't worry about that yet. We're not going to go into the math yet, and you don't have to panic. It'll make sense and it'll be okay. The important thing right now, though, is to understand what's happening. This will help later on in your course. So if demand is elastic, what that means is it's going to be really sensitive to price changes. We're going to have big moves. Think of things that you don't necessarily always need to purchase. Actually, when we're determining if something's elastic or inelastic, there's normally three questions that you could ask yourself that'll help you kind of better understand. One, can the purchase be delayed? If it can, it might be elastic. If it can't, it might be inelastic. And two, are there actual adequate substitute goods? So if all of a sudden this good becomes more expensive, can I just purchase something else? If I can, it might be an elastic good then. If it can't be, inelastic. And then does the product or whatever I'm purchasing require a lot of money? If it does, then it might become where we have to buy it, especially if the other two, it will be inelastic. If not, it'll probably more be elastic. On the other hand, if there's substitute goods and also I don't need it, but it requires a lot, it could be then elastic. Now, I've used elastic and inelastic a lot in the past minute, but what are these really meaning? Like I've already said, elastic is referencing the relationship between our quantity demanded and price changes. When we have a small change, if all of a sudden our demand gets cut in half, let's say the price goes up by a dollar, and all of a sudden now our demand goes from 40 to 20. Well, that would show elastic we are very susceptible to price changes. Inelastic, though, is saying, hey, demand is not going to be impacted by price that much. People are going to be buying this regardless. So all of a sudden, we go up by $5, and our demand maybe drops by a couple. Maybe it goes down by 5 This is showing an inelastic demand. People have to buy this product normally. These are goods that, no matter what the price is, people are going to buy it. They will buy less of it, but they're still going to purchase it. Where elastic demand, we're going to see these big movements because what's happening there is people will then go to something else. Now, if you ever have an unit elastic demand, all that is saying is it is proportional. If let's say price goes up by 5%, what's going to happen? Our demand will go down by 5%. It's going to be about the exact same. That's the important thing to understand so far. With this also comes our total revenue. Now, we're going to get into a total revenue test later on when we talk about elasticity in the math. The important thing for you to know so far about total revenue is to figure it out. We just take whatever our price is and we times it by our quantity. That shows how much money was generated or sometimes it's referenced as total expenditures. This is just the amount of money being spent. So again, to figure that out, we're just going to take our quantity demanded, so whatever we're going to be selling there, and times it by our price. And that'll show you again our total revenue. 
Hopefully this is kind of making sense of some of the different types of demand. Hopefully also the changes in demand make sense to you and also the quantity change and the law of demand and a demand schedule and a demand curve. And as you can see, we've covered a ton here. So make sure you subscribe to the channel. I'm Mr. Sin. I hope I was able to help you out. If you still have questions, make sure to put them in the comments below so I can help you out. And until next time, I'll see you online. All right. That's good. It's good. If you made it this far, like, congrats. You really did have the three things for demand. Because that's impressive. This is a long video. We're done now. I think that's good.